When we read the story of Jesus' homecoming, it's natural to question the people of Nazareth for failing to recognize that Jesus is something special. Had you and I been there, we would have shown the man some respect, right? We know who he is. We would have followed him around to all of his public speaking engagements. We would have bought the t-shirts and cheered him on in the streets. We would have hung on every word he said. We would have known that he was a son of God. But then having 2,000 years of hindsight and Bible literacy can do that for us. But let us put ourselves in the place of those who lived alongside Jesus and of those who grew up with him. If someone you had known all your life Someone that you knew very well returned home preaching and claiming to perform healing miracles. You'd probably have a hard time believing that person hadn't gone around the bend. What would you do if somebody, I don't know, maybe Fred Schaefer, just stood up and said, I am the Son of God, and I can perform miracles. You see what I mean, of course. Thank you. Now, Nazareth was a small town by one estimate of around 500 people or so. Most everybody in Nazareth would have known Jesus' whole life, and while they were astounded at what was said about him, they were dubious as well. Were you and I there, and had we known Jesus since his childhood, we probably would have been no different. Isn't this the carpenter, they ask? Isn't this the son of Mary? The tone of their questions sounds like they could be thinking, isn't this the same kid whose diapers I changed and who used to throw rocks at the neighbor's cat? The kid who dated Josiah's daughter and used to drive his mother's ox cart around town like a bat out of hell? In a very real way, Jesus has become a stranger in his own hometown. Not because the people of Nazareth didn't know Jesus, but because they knew him all too well. And they couldn't grasp a new truth about who he was being revealed to be. Mark also tells us that Jesus could do no deeds of power and only healed a few sick people, which is pretty astounding considering the stories that Mark just told us in the preceding chapter, the chapter that Joan read from, about Jesus healing the hemorrhaging woman and raising Jairus' daughter from the dead. It sounds like Jesus was powerless in his own hometown, but that's just not the case. Now, the hemorrhaging woman, who is ritually unclean because of her menstrual flow that's lasted 12 years, violates law and custom by coming into town and by brushing up against the people in the crowd in her attempt to touch Jesus. As she fought her way through the crowd, every person she touched became ritually unclean as well, just like she was. She's being a nuisance, and she faces public wrath and scorn in her effort to be healed. Yet Jesus stops what he's doing and takes the time to talk with her. And he tells her, your faith has made you well. Mark interweaves her story with that of Jairus, who Mark tells us is at the opposite end of the social spectrum from the hemorrhaging woman. A leader of the synagogue, he falls at Jesus' feet begging for Jesus to come and heal his daughter. And when they arrive at Jairus' home and find the little girl dead, Jesus tells Jairus, do not fear, only believe. Two very different people, both believing that Jesus can somehow make a difference in their lives, take a step of faith to reach out to Jesus, and in so doing, receive healing and wholeness. So why is it that these two people are healed, yet in the very next chapter, in his own hometown no less, Jesus is unable to heal anyone? Now I've heard this passage interpreted to mean that the people of Jesus' hometown didn't believe and so they couldn't be healed, which might give the idea that droves of Jesus' friends and neighbors came out to see him and present themselves for healing, but as hard as he tried, Jesus just couldn't penetrate their powerful doubt shields but think about the hemorrhaging woman. She has said nothing about Jesus. When Jesus says, your faith has made you well, he's referring to the fact that her presence there in that crowd shows that she believes that Jesus can heal her. Woody Allen is credited with saying that showing up is 80% of life. 
And I would argue that faith is the same way. You see, the real reason why Jesus was unable to perform any deeds of power in Nazareth was because nobody showed up. Unbelief is not some sort of kryptonite that renders Jesus to a quivering bowl of jello, unable to perform miracles or heal the sick. No. Jesus is thwarted by the town people's unbelief. He's not thwarted by their unbelief. He is thwarted by their absence. Think about it. Who would go to Jesus for healing that didn't believe that Jesus could heal? Peter Popoff was a well-known faith healer during the 1970s and most of the 80s. At the peak of his popularity, he reportedly was earning $4.3 million a month, mostly from donations made by people who believed that he could perform miracles. Popoff was famous for allegedly hearing the voice of God, telling him the names and personal information of members of the congregation and identifying their specific ailments so that he could call them up on stage and heal them. But it was revealed in 1987 that he was actually receiving the information via an in-ear radio, which received a broadcast from his wife, who had collected the information from the congregates in advance. After his fraud was revealed to the public on an episode of The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, Peter Popoff was forced to declare bankruptcy because people quit coming to his revivals. He was a fraud and a con man, but when people thought he could heal them, they came in droves. When they no longer believed he could heal, they quit coming. And that's why Jesus was ineffective in his hometown because the people who knew him so well didn't really believe that he could do anything. They didn't believe he could heal him, so they never gave him the chance, thus proving that they really didn't know him like they thought they did. But what's really interesting is that like the people of Nazareth, neither the hemorrhaging woman nor Jairus make any statement of faith about who Jesus is. They did not address Jesus as Son of God or Messiah, and as a matter of fact, when the people come from Jairus' home to tell him that his daughter has died, they call Jesus teacher. It's even possible that they have no belief about who Jesus is beyond the fact that they believe he can heal them. But their actions are a statement of faith. So while these stories appear to be about miracles and healing, they're really about faith and what it means to have faith in Jesus as the Son of God. Now, as we've talked about before, there are two kinds of faith. There's faith that knows something is true and faith that acts on that knowledge. The first kind of faith believes in the existence of Jesus Christ and in his significance for our lives, that he was a real man who lived and taught in Palestine in the earliest part of the first century and was crucified by the Roman Empire for sedition, that he is the Son of God, that in his life, death, and resurrection, the fullness of God's love and mercy were revealed, and that through him, humanity has been reconciled to God. The second kind of faith trusts in that Jesus, allowing him to guide us and to help us live our lives as his disciples. The difference between the true is the difference between knowing that a bridge will hold you up and actually walking out across it or better yet, the Grand Canyon Skyway. You know the Grand Canyon Skyway? I see a head or two nodding. It opened in March of 2007, and the Skyway is a horseshoe-shaped sh a glass walkway that sticks out 66 feet over the Grand Canyon, affording visitors a clear view down to the bottom of the canyon some 3,600 feet below. That's over 1,000 feet higher than the world's tallest skyscraper. And did I mention that the walls and floor of the Skyway are made of two inch thick glass? Now I've read that according to educated people who know about such things, the Grand Canyon Skyway is perfectly safe, but there's a big difference between knowing that it's safe and walking out onto it. And that's the nature of faith as we see it here in Mark's gospel. Those who have faith may not fully understand who Jesus is, but they are willing to trust him with their very lives. Carol Bechtel Reynolds, in her book, Life After Grace, writes about the Exodus and that moment when the Israelites 
fresh from their escape from slavery, find themselves cornered with the Red Sea yawning out towards the horizon before them and the rampaging Egyptian army rushing up from behind. She writes, This situation is one of those good news, bad news times in scripture that we can only feel really appreciate if we enter into the story as participants. Imagine the thrill of wonder as you feel God's breath on your face and see the waters begin to part. Yet imagine the thrill of fear when you realize that God means for you to walk between those walls of water. The real miracle of the Red Sea, Carol writes, was not that the waters parted, but that the people went forward. That's faith as complete trust in God. And quite honestly, sometimes those first steps of faith, and even the ones that come further down the line, can be a frightening proposition. As frightening as any clear glass walkway some 3,000 feet up. But that's what trusting God means. Taking those steps every day and believing that the life Christ calls us to really is the best life for us. So while faith is acknowledging who Jesus is and what his life, death, and resurrection means for us, that's not all faith is. Matthew records Jesus as saying, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And Luke remembers Jesus asking, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? And it's in the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, and Luke that we hear the words of Jesus saying, if any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For Jesus... Believing is doing. So faith in Christ cannot be be just simple acknowledgement of Jesus' divinity. Faith means becoming a disciple and dedicating ourselves wholeheartedly to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is a comfort and a challenge. It's a comfort in that we are reminded by the gospel that God is our rock and our redeemer, a very present help in time of trouble. As the psalmist writes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. When we experience the worst of life, when we know that we can, then we know that we can depend on God, that we can fight through the crowds to touch Jesus' cloak, that we can kneel before Christ and ask for help. And while we may not get the exact help or answers that we hope for, we can find solace in the words of Paul that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In that we can believe. In that we can trust. But the gospel is also a challenge in that it reminds us every day that we're called to live as disciples, walking in Jesus' footsteps, doing the things that Jesus did, and living the way that Jesus taught us to live, loving God, loving our neighbors, and loving our enemies too. In that, we can believe. In that, we can trust. Had we grown up with Jesus? Had we known him as a child? Had we played with him in the playground, known him as Jesus and, Mary's, uh, Jesus and uh, Joseph and Mary's boy? Had we lived next door to his family for years, we probably wouldn't have believed that Jesus could be any more than a simple carpenter. But here in this holy place, we encounter the risen Christ And we know that he is so much more. But while we may recognize who Jesus is, we are effectively faced with the same choice with which his friends and neighbors were faced all those many years ago. Will we allow him to make a difference in our lives? Or will he remain a stranger among us? To God be all glory, honor, power, and dominion in this world and the world that is to come.